Today, we are going to talk about uh, one of my favorite uh, all-time topics, which is um, system cleanup. So system contamination, specifically after compressor burnout, um, that kind of stuff. And we have uh, our esteemed guest today, Mr. Jim Jansen. So uh, Jim is with uh, Sporlin. And I, I want to just give you a couple seconds, just introduce yourself. What do you what do you do day in and day out over at Sporlin? Well, like paycheck. I try to get paid for doing as little as possible. Uh, and that's I'm being facetious there. <laughs> Uh, but I, one of my key roles after many, many years from being anything from the customer service manager to application engineering manager and design engineer, I now find myself primarily doing things like this, uh, webinars, uh, in-person training, and YouTube videos of sorts. And I'm involved with probably being the uh, um, primary trainer of all our new field sales engineers that we hire. So in a short amount of time, that's me. And so Good. sometimes you get to stay up late and like sit in your office and, and talk to people. I, you time. know, when I agreed to do this, I had no idea. I mean, I told I told Matt and Adam I had to cut my stay at the bar short tonight and come back in here. <laughs> okay. So it's going to be especially fun tonight is what we're, is what we're saying. Yeah. I, it's always fun. Always. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so yeah. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, no, it's good to have you here. This is, like I said, it, I'm not being, I'm not joking when I say this is one of my favorite topics because there's so much, uh, so much stuff to talk about here, and so much stuff that isn't practiced well in the trade. So this is an opportunity for us to uh, to cover it pretty well here. So I want to just start by um, kind of setting the groundwork when we think about system cleanup. Obviously, you talk a lot in, in the market refrigeration space and sort of larger equipment. Uh, we're going to have some people who are going to be listening from that space, but also some people from re from residential. But universally, what are some of the biggest sources of contamination, and how do we kind of think about keeping it out in the first place or preventing it in, uh, issues in the first place? Uh, there's a whole range of ways it can be introduced, from things as simple as the ambient moisture that might be entrained. You know, how often do people pull a vacuum on a new system? You know, that's a good thing. Uh, there's a image of actual parts uh, we'll, we'll get a valve return to our warranty group and they'll dismantle it and you know the complaint is the valve doesn't work anymore um there's reasons why it no longer does i mean the single biggest cause of our products to discontinue functioning the way they should is because of the introduction of contamination uh moisture is a still is a big problem can be introduced a lot of ways, and oftentimes we don't take good measures to eliminate it. Uh, other things such as, gosh, things simply like, I guess, you guys brazed with a nitrogen purge, maybe, or not. A lot of people don't. Um, I mean, we've certainly we got the press fitting idea, but you can't always use a press fitting. And, and gosh, I think being able to braze is a key thing, but that can introduce contamination into a system, especially if you're in a hurry or if you've got folks that aren't the most skilled, uh, you can end up with, you know, carbonized products, oxidation in the system. And then with just a little bit of moisture and some heat, and maybe you get to a point where you're running some high discharge temperatures because you've got a dirty condenser or you've got a condenser fan motor that's not working like it ought to. Uh, and the list goes on there. The next thing you know, maybe you've got some lubricant that starts to break down. And then you introduce a third component to the moisture and you got heat. And now maybe you start making acid. And you can also have the, that breakdown with other chemicals that are in the system. We always like to say that only two things we want to see circulating in a refrigeration system are the refrigerant that's intended to be there and not some concoction that you've made by charging it with something else and making your own mix of sorts, uh, but refrigerant and the appropriate lubricant. Uh, depending on the lubricant these days, I mean, the POE is, I don't want to be pejorative here, but POE has some aggressive tendencies with respect to moisture and then to a scouring action that it can tend to have. So. If you don't handle the lubricant properly, you can introduce some moisture there too, and then have it deteriorate and cause problems. I mean, how do we, how, you know, POE can separate into acid and moisture when it deteriorates in the right situation. No, 
those are some things. Yeah. I mean, so, every once in a while, you may even have, you may have residual from a uh, process fluid from one thing or another that can cause some interesting things to happen. We've had that happen in the industry over the years, a number of times. Um, somebody tries something new and different in their manufacturing process and it causes interesting things and it'll uh, one thing that you're almost guaranteed to clog up is the thermostatic expansion valve if there's one in the system and that's for a number of reasons that that happened and that one is there's extremely small passageways and in, in the nominal size valve that you'll see in maybe a two or three ton system and that's the location of a large pressure drop i guess the largest pressure drop in the system so things that are in solution tend to drop out with a pressure drop along with a big change in temperature. So you got the change in temperature, you got the change in pressure, and you got the small passageways. That thermostatic expansion valve acts like the best strainer you can buy. And it's one of the most expensive ones you can buy. Yeah, and that's where we get, uh, in residential, we get all this bad TXV stuff. It's one of the reasons why we get that. Yeah. Um, but in places like market refrigeration or, or in, especially in built up systems, so specifically like market refrigeration, where you can uh, replace strainers or clean strainers, you find this all the time that uh, that you, you, you get them full of all kinds of gunk that would have otherwise uh, made it into the valve. And so that's where, of course, line dryers come in. We're going to talk a lot about line dryers. Um, but a couple other things I just want to add to the conversation, especially for the residential audience, is a lot of times just your initial practices of how you handle your line set. Yeah. Um, if you, I, I see so many guys who they're, you know, they're working and this is Florida thing. Cause it rains every afternoon here. I see guys yeah. trying to brazen equipment while it's raining and rainwater is, you know, pouring down into the copper while they're trying to brazen. I mean, it's just crazy stuff like that, that you'll see at times. Uh, other thing is when people will ream or deburr, they'll drop shavings down in, they won't be careful. They'll, they'll, you know, just get the copper down in the dirt. One of the most extreme cases that we saw, um, here in central Florida, uh, at a place I used to work was we had installers who weren't raising shut the line sets when they were pushing them through chases, underground chases. And those underground chases were full of sand and water. And so the, the plastic plugs would break off the ends and they would just jam those suckers full of sand and water. And, and of course, even a line dryer is not going to handle that level of contamination uh, very well. But it, uh, the first thing that I always want to encourage people and before we start to get into some more of these, um, you know, kind of expected things that can go wrong with the system is start with the basics. Keep liquid water out of the system. Uh, and like you mentioned, pull a really good vacuum. We all know how to do that now with large hoses, pulling cores, all that stuff. We all know how to flow nitrogen while we're brazing. If you don't know how to do it and you think it's hard, just we've done a million pieces of content on that. It's not difficult at all. It's not a big deal. Um, just do that. It's, oh. it's, I think it's also really important. Like when you are actually working with the copper and you're fitting the pipe, um, I like to try to always keep the caps on at all times, unless you are actually, you know, it needs to be off the ground or capped. Like you shouldn't leave open pipe in your truck laying on the ground. Um, just prevents a lot of unnecessary things from entering the pipe. The other thing it's, and I've seen this happen. It's good to keep track of those caps and make sure at some point that you do take them off. Uh, we've had in supermarket systems, uh, EPRs fail uh, after a startup because, or when they were trying to pull a vacuum because they got a pipe plug in them because somebody left it somehow. I don't know how they got in the valve, but it did. Wasn't our cap, it was somebody else's. Anyway. Yeah, I left a, um, I left a uh, a plug in hard copper one time when we were doing a uh, a walk in one of the first walk ins that we did one of those internal plugs left it in and it made it because when we brazed it in it, it softened it up and it made it all the way back to the rack um, before it uh, before it hit the EPR so yeah those those things <laughs> those things also can happen uh, and that was that was me so I'll take advantage I'll take uh, credit for that one um, all right so let's talk a little bit about um some of the internal causes of because because a lot of what we're going to talk about is burnout that's one of the most common times that people are going to be addressing these issues um so let's talk about the causes of that type of burnout in the first place like i, I think a lot of people always imagine that like electrical failures uh, on a compressor are always caused by electrical causes but that isn't always true actually anybody wants to take that one I'm just, I just teed, I just, I teed it up there just to let like Jim, Matt, anyone. <laughs> electrical failures aren't always caused by electrical causes. No, you got um, 
I think, I mean, electrical <laughs> failures, I think uh, you, you could have electrical failures in the motor, right? If you, if you start building up sure. acid, like if, uh, an acid comes from moisture, um, that's a byproduct of not pulling a proper vacuum. So that could cause a compressor to fail. Um, but a lot of, but in a lot of cases, like mechanical problems lead to electrical failure. This is the point that I'm All right. To. So, so I think I'm, here's, Go ahead. here's where you're going. You, yeah. Here's a couple of things that let's say you have continual flood back to the compressor and you start causing wear patterns and different moving parts or heaven forbid you have a big slug, a liquid come back to certain styles of compressors that don't handle that well you can cause some fairly substantial mechanical failures in a compressor. Now, I'm no compressor expert by a long shot, but I've seen some things that have been broken and not necessarily a fault of the compressor. Uh, so you start causing wear on mechanical components or you break something and you continue to run that compressor with those broken parts on it. You strain it, things get in a bind, and the next thing you might have an overloaded circuit, or if you've already done some other bad things, and with heat and moisture and, and uh, you know, constituents from the breakdown of either the lubricant or the refrigerant, now you've got an acid forming and you start wearing away on any insulation that might be somewhere in the system. Next thing you could do is have that electrical problem now surfaced where you wouldn't have had it otherwise that makes sense yeah yeah and That's i think yeah it's all connected i mean we most of the compressors we're working on are refrigerant cooled and so refrigerant and your motor are all in there together along with the mechanical parts you have some massive failure on the compressor where things start you know i always I always use this visual and it's probably not how it usually happens but if you imagine something breaks off of that compressor and starts bouncing around in there um, you're very likely going to also have winding damage as part of that. Okay. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning, and and uh, I wanted to I wanted to put this up here because Craig uh, Craig Egan mentioned this. Um, restricted TXV can cause a compressor burnout, but even broader than that, a restricted TXV. What does that cause? Well, that causes low suction pressure, causes high compression ratio. Right? What happens when you have low suction pressure? You have low refrigerant density returning to that compressor, which means that compressor runs hot. Right. That's what happens when you have low suction pressure. And so a compressor running hot over time can cause a compressor to fail. And a lot of people will say, well, that compressor has a thermal overload on it. That thermal overload keeps it from damaging itself. Not when it not when it resets and goes back and overheats, you know, 50, 100, uh, 500 times over time. Eventually, that compressor is going to be much more prone to failure uh, under those sorts of circumstances. So restricted TXV, even a restricted line dryer, if it's left in. Um, system being low on charge, uh, dirty condenser coil that causes high compression ratio, high head pressure, um, high discharge temperature, all of those things that cause a compressor to run hot. You already mentioned, uh, obviously, if there's cases where you're getting flood back or you're getting a slug environment, that's the other side of the equation. Uh, that's right. liquid, liquid refrigerant coming back to the compressor. But either yeah. one of those, whether you have really high superheats or you have really low superheats to zero, where you have flood back, both of those can cause compressor failure, which in end result in uh, massive system contamination. Is that everybody, nobody's saying anything. I think you are on to some good points. Yeah. If you go back to your original, <laughs> no, if you go back to your original uh, thing, you asked me, I mean, we've got some, we've got some literature out there and we've got published documents that say, if you're going to do a temporary installation in a, in a suction line, that the maximum pressure drop you can stand across that device is around anywhere from four to eight psi depending on the application depending on the refrigerant so it, it gets back to you know a, that kind of rudimentary five psi to maybe have the bypass switch and then okay so you've got five psi there that you're you know is happening in some way shape or form um I don't know. Are you asking for trouble in the long haul to walk away from that? You just said a clogged up expansion device can cause you problems. A clogged up liquid line filter dryer could cause you problems. Good practice to take it out. Yeah. When it's all said and done. Let's talk about that now. Let's talk about um, actually first, before we talk about line dryers, let's talk about a question that a lot of people have, which is this question about uh, using chemical flushes 
uh, and line sets, that type of thing. Um, oh, wow. I wasn't sure where you were going with the pigs on <laughs> line dryers, flushes, and pigs. I yeah. don't know if that was a reference to... <laughs> Uh, no, this is not, of some... no, this okay. is not a police right. reference, not a reference to police. Uh, so yeah, using, using some no sort of, no, 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 none of that. No, no, yeah. no, we're staying away from all that. Uh, all right. you know, Thank some you. physical object that we force through the lines with pressure. There's a couple different brands that, that make them now. Uh, I'm a huge fan of using that in lieu of chemicals or using a little bit of a solvent, but running it ahead of the pig. So that way you get it all out physically. Uh, it's the name okay. for it. I mean, it's just, it's just the name for okay. it. Uh, you, you had me, you had me off. You had me thrown off with that. I wasn't sure. Where you were <laughs> okay. I mean, okay. okay. And I, I understand what you're talking about. So what are your thoughts on that? Obviously you're the, you're the line dryer guy. Um, oh, well. But, but how do you feel about uh, chemicals, you know, acid reducers, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, if you, okay. All right. Here's, I don't have experience with the rubber pigs. That's, I mean, I, I, I'm going to say, I understand the concept and I've heard of them being used, but I can't say I have a lot of experience with that. As far as the chemicals are concerned, uh, we've, we've experimented with that over the years. Um, our, our chemists that we've had on board, depending on who they were, always contended and, uh, and complied with what I said earlier. The only things they want circulating in the system are refrigerant and lubricant. And anything else they feel is a contaminant. So these dyes for chasing down leaks, uh, things for, uh, what do you say, for neutralizing an acid and so on and so on, are Band-Aids. Uh, are they helpful Band-Aids? Sometimes they are. But they don't fix the root problem. If you if you have acid in the system, you need to find out what's causing that and eliminate it. If you if you have a leak, you need to fix the darn leak or replace the part that's leaking. You know, sometimes evaporators are real troublesome, and it's impossible to repair the leak, much less even find it. But you know it's there. So what do you do? Maybe you have to replace the whole evaporator section. So um, I don't have. Experience with the pig. If you have had good experience with it, Brian, I, you know, what the heck? Uh, as far as the additive chemicals, I know there are companies that make a living selling those. And I don't want to keep them from making a living and making money and all that kind of stuff. But our our stance has been to to limit that as much as you can and and go after. It's easy for me to say sitting here in my nice warm, comfy area in my office that, you know, fix the problem, you know, when, like what you say, it's the middle of the night and it's storming and you're trying to get somebody up and running again. Uh, they got a big event the next day and the air conditioning's down or, or you've got a walk-in cooler at a supermarket and they're about to lose product and you're struggling to get things resolved. So you do what you got to do sometimes. Yeah. I, off, I have a question kind of off of that. Um, I've I've heard some different things recently about taking the uh, the dryer. Like uh, there's some brands that put the dryer on the inside of the condenser. Um, oh, okay. And, we're talking about uh, liquid line. So, so let's be specific here because we're yeah, going to talk. Line. So tonight we're going to talk about liquid line dryers. We're going to talk about suction line dryers. We're talking about factory installed inside the condenser liquid line dryers. Keep going. You're going liquid line now, right? Um. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Probably talking li liquid line dryer. Yes. Correct. Yeah. I'm, correct. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It, is it better to take those out? Because then at that point, if you remove it, then you have to pull a vacuum on the entire condenser, which could potentially, which is full of, full of oil. Um, so are you sometimes, could you potentially be opening yourself up to doing more damage by replacing it? Is it bad okay, to have to? Well, okay. I've, I've got an answer to some of this. And I think one of the visuals that I provided to you folks, I've got a, I've got a list of conditions I don't know if it's, yeah, there. Uh, this slide right here does a couple of things. One, it sort of shows our preferred location for a liquid line filter dryer, which is ahead of the expansion device. And the purpose for that is to help protect the expansion device. Uh, we first developed the uh, product that we use and without, I mean, is it okay if I say catch all? Yeah, of course. Yeah. You're the, right. you're the, this Portland's here. So yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. So we developed a catch-all back in the 1940s because we were getting inundated 
with expansion valve failures because of contamination at the time, just over and over and over and over. So our contention was that the absolute best place for the filter dryer was to be as an insurance policy to keep that expansion device working properly by keeping junk out of it. So where I've got it located there was our preferred spot. Now, in the situation where the OEM has already installed one, uh, my attitude has been about it. Um, in a way, it's kind of answered here. What, which, which one of these? Uh, um, dun, 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 dun. This one is open for service or repair to renew the protective capacity. If the system's all buttoned up and it's working nicely and you don't experience any problems with it, my contention would be at that point to leave it to hell alone. Well, let's say you have a, a leak on the evaporator coil and you could, pump down, you, you could pump down the refrigerant into and then that way you're not opening up the compressor well right? if you got a leak to fix that's different now you've got now you need to open the system for service or repair now you're addressing that so you're going to fix the leak it's it's as arduous as it sounds and it's full of vacuum time and you know have new protective devices in place does that but, make sense like i think like you know um on the flip side of the coin though you are i think what matt is trying to say is you are now introducing oxygen and maybe moisture to the compressor oils and now you're removing all the refrigerant from the system and you could potentially be adding more contaminants and if you okay. pull the vacuum appropriate like um in a proper manner in the first place is the filter dryer the liquid line filter dryer contaminated where it needs to be replaced um and I, I get it they've it's something that we like everyone has said for years you have to remove the liquid line filter dryer and replace it but okay, like, I, I guess i'm not quite sure i follow the point you're trying to make you're saying the filter dryer that was installed by the oem in the condensing unit yeah yeah all right you're you're saying for some reason i've now gone back into the system to repair a problem Yep. Yes. No, am I, yeah. On um, the on the evaporator side of the service. Okay. Right? All right. Um, you know, it, if you've opened up the system, my contention would be the filter dryer that's there, regardless of where the heck it is, it's done its job. It's time to replace it. Now, would I put a new one back in in the condensing unit if I had opened up the system? I, I I'm like I likely wouldn't. I yeah. mean. I would. I don't. I, would I don't. <laughs> I, always I would install <laughs> the filter dryer here where we're showing it, and I would replace that. I, I would put a section of copper or whatever to replace the filter dryer that had been in the condensing unit. But I guess what I'm saying, I wouldn't just de facto go in and re and and remove that filter dryer unless I had a reason to do so. Gotcha. Even though that's not our recommended choice or it's not our suggested best location for it i know for years many installers would put a filter dryer and maybe even a sight glass of some kind whether it was rc all or someone else's out at the condensing unit because it was accessible and and okay it's better than not having one is it the best place for it it's probably not the best place for it and the fact that the OEM is at least putting one out there to begin with. It's probably a good thing because sometimes it, it, there isn't one at all. I mean, there's many subdivisions that go in with a base model unit and the base model units generally are pretty good. They just don't have a lot of fancy stuff added to them. And maybe they've got a base level of efficiency associated with them. It doesn't mean they won't condition the air and cool your house. And but they oftentimes will get no protection at all. So unless you've done a nice job of handling the line sets, like Brian, you were saying to begin with, then you maybe pull the vacuum, hopefully, and then you've done a nice job of brazing if you had to brace, um, you are left with some potential problems that could eventually haunt you. But sometimes those systems will get put together reasonably well without a filter dryer at all, and they work for years. Yeah, I mean, filter dryer is there as a uh, additional protection. It's um, an insurance it's one, policy, it's, but it's one that we found to be very, very uh, 
uh, it works very really well. Does it does a great job, right? That's the word I was looking for. Effective. That was the word I was looking for. Um, so <laughs> let me I just what, you did, you did, and it okay. was well, it was well chosen. Well, you, um, you, let me weigh in on this quickly. Um, and we have before the the main thing that we want to make sure of is that we do not have pressure drop. Um, and and especially on suction, which we're going to talk about here in a second, we don't want to have pressure drop. Um, we want to make sure that the system is clean, dry, and tight. There may be some cases, especially when you're looking at a maybe a client situation where price is the is the main factor, uh, and you know you're going to be in and out on the evaporator side of the valves and whatever. But always recognize that's still not the best practice. It, it hurts our heart sometimes not to do the best practice. But let's be real honest: uh, everything in this trade is a trade off, and it's better to make it with your eyes wide open, uh, with a clear conversation with the client. And if it is going to save a significant amount of labor and a significant amount of money to do it that way, then fine. One of the things that I want to throw in, though, that I think is important is one of the things that Adam's getting to is that whenever you have a choice between pumping down a system or recovering all the refrigerant, um, it can be a significant difference because of the fact that recovery tanks are not cleaned. Um, and that's something that I that it dry. I, I, this is something I didn't understand okay. for the longest time. And I, want, and I want to put it out there. So. When you're taking clean refrigerant out, putting it in a recovery tank, and now reintroducing that into the system, you're very likely putting much dirtier refrigerant in there. So then the only safe bet is to go with virgin refrigerant, and now that even greatly, that much more increases the price. Right. So those are all, all things that you have to consider, but just do it with your eyes wide open and just know that the best practice is if you open that system for service, cutting that, that old liquid line dryer out and putting the new one where I put it is by the by the evaporator coil inside by the metering device. That's where I have always done it, um, and we continue to do it that way. That's still considered the best practice by all the players uh, out there. So, um, I want to now go to the question of the different things that are in these dryers, though. So I want to talk oh, about wow. these about these three desks. Where'd you get this? It's it's good stuff. I think we got it from you. I'm guessing. yeah. Oh, maybe. I think yeah. you sent it to us. I'm guessing. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Does it look familiar? Maybe, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. It's all mine. Right. Yeah, I sent ah, okay. it to you. <laughs> okay, good, good. I, everything I sent to you, I tried to be, how should I say, non-commercial mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in nature, and this is very non-commercial. These are three of the very typical desiccant materials that most filter dryer manufacturers will utilize, and they get utilized for different reasons, and it's because of the way... Uh, the uh, molded core, if, if it is indeed a molded core, uh, the pore spaces that will uh, be left uh, in their ability to trap different molecules. For instance, molecular sieve is a desiccant. In fact, you could probably call it activated molecular sieve if you wanted to be real generic. Uh, it is very uh, capable of capturing moisture. And in some instances, filter dryer manufacturers will use 100% molecular sieve if that is a primary importance to them and nothing else happens to be. Whereas activated alumina will have pore spaces that are better able to capture acid molecules. And the activated carbon seems to do well with materials that might be a result of uh, deteriorated lubricants or other such things of that ilk. And in a lot of cases, things that you have no idea what they are. And in fact, when we had that issue with a, a few years back with a residual that came as a result of leftover processing fluids, that proved to be quite helpful in removing that material, even though we really didn't know what it was. Now, some manufacturers, Sporlins one, will make a mix of molecular sieve and activated alumina so that the filter dryer does a reasonably good job at capturing moisture and acid. Uh, and that's how that's usually done. Whereas the activated carbon is usually in the filter dryer that you might put in a suction line. And people always say, well, I want the best acid protection after a burnout. Well, well, the activated carbon is actually not the best. Molecular sieve is not the best, but activated alumina is the best at capturing acid molecules, if that's what you're after. But the activated carbon is really good at picking up that dirt and debris that's circulating in the system following the burnout. And that's why it's particularly beneficial to have that in the suction line and then a good blended core 
uh, with molecular sieve and activated alumina in the liquid line as a combination. Is there a way for technicians to tell like what the cores are made out of if they're going after a certain task? Well, um, we've got some, I mean, you can, you can get a pretty good idea of what it is by visually looking at it if it's not completely fouled. Uh, if you went back to that one image that I had, I mean, if these are, are already installed uh, and it's a replaceable core, then you might have a bit of a problem of discerning exactly what it was. But if it's, uh, you know, if it's a sealed model, uh, it, it provided it hasn't been totally destroyed over the years of service, uh, they're clearly marked as to what they are. Oh, okay. Uh, the uh, the standard filter dryer is going to be a mix of molecular sieve and activated alumina that you're going to see in a liquid line. The activated carbon you're going to find in our HH designated products, whether they're a replaceable core or a sealed model. Yeah, and that's fairly yeah. universal. When you see HH dryers, that means that you have activated carbon. But to your point, and this is, I think, is a very important distinction. You don't just say, I have acid, go to activated carbon, right? Because acid and activated carbon aren't the same. Uh, like, And in fact, because a lot of acids nowadays, answer. yeah, a lot of acids nowadays are actually caused by breakdown of POE uh, exactly. and due to moisture. And so if you're dealing with that issue, well, then that actually makes a lot more sense. You have a wet system. Uh, that makes a lot more sense just to leave that typical uh, activated aluminum molecular sieve in there and only go to the activated carbon when you know you have actual internal contamination caused by something like a compressor burnout. Right. And it's not necessarily, you know, the activated carbon is not the best uh, product for capturing those acid molecules. It's the aluminum. Can, can we, yeah, for sure. Yep. Can we talk through like how you would go about, uh, you know, kind of looking at a system and figuring out what you think happened and what, yeah, sort of the diagnosis process of. Well, let's talk about, I mean, so like, I, th I think on that front, let's talk about the different, actually, let's pull up that slide that we already looked at there uh, in terms of uh, on doing the liquid line dryer. The, the times that you would replace a liquid line dryer are a lot of these same things. You have a moisture indicator, right? Talk through some of that, like, because obviously you work more in the grocery space a lot. So talk about well, no, but, uh, uh, moisture. Uh, uh, Brian, om almost all of this is applicable to residential and commercial air conditioning. So uh, initial system install, you, you, you want to have a clean, fresh filter dryer and a liquid line. Some people will put a suction line filter, not a filter dryer, in at the same time. That's just something that they're doing to help protect a compressor. We're not necessarily suggesting it here, but that is something some folks do. You open the system because you're fixing a leak. You're you're replacing some component that is not productive anymore, that has failed to do its job because of one reason or another, oftentimes because of contamination. If the liquid line filter dryer exhibits a pressure drop of, we've said five PSI here, you can al always you can also see that depending on the refrigerant with a certain amount of temperature drop across it as well. So that means it's done its job. It's dirty. It's time to replace it. We'll sometimes get filter dryers back from customers. They say this has excessive pressure drop across it. It has failed. No, it's done its job and it's not going to work any longer. It's time to replace it. If the moisture indicator and we're showing a moisture indicator on the outlet of the filter dryer and at the inlet of the expansion device, that uh, moisture indicator can give you some indication that the system's wet. And if you're seeing that, then you got a so source of moisture that perhaps you need to deal with, whatever that might be. Uh, if you do an acid test after some kind of failure, now here's the thing where it gets a little tricky. If you're dealing with a residential system, how are you gonna get a lubricant sample to do an acid test? You're almost gonna have to have something really seriously break so that you can collect something from it like maybe a compressor and maybe you can collect some, some lubricant there to do an acid test now we sell a kit that'll give you a very rudimentary indication of the presence of acid now if you're having a lot of problems with particular units or systems or a big installation 
there are, are third party labs that will run a more comprehensive test for you if you really want to drill down and find out what's going on. That's something that sometimes a supermarket will do or a bigger commercial entity will do. If you've had a compressor burnout of any kind, uh, and usually that would be determined by the amount of acid that's present, um, you would install an oversized liquid line filter dryer. If you have, you know, what's the difference between a major and a minor burnout? Well, again, it has to do with acid and that might be indicate, indicate a suction line filter dryer be installed along with a clean liquid line filter dryer. And then again, our approach was to go back after a period of time, check the pressure drop across that suction line filter dryer and then, then replace it, either replace it or put a copper piece in to replace that, that, that one section. And then finally, if you've got the system all cleaned up, then make sure you've got a clean, it sounds like we're trying to sell filter dryers here, uh, but then put another filter dryer in. <laughs> Just have an infinity number of filter dryers. Um, you know, again, Every time you look at an air conditioner, put a filter, put a filter dryer. You bet. <laughs> yeah, darn you right. Clean um, the filter dryer. So a couple of things that I just want to mention here, and because we have the liberty of, of working on a lot of different sides of the industry. So if you have access to the oil, and so you will on a lot of larger systems, you're working on a, you know, a semi-hermetic compressor, you're working in a rack environment, sure. you can actually sure. get access to the oil and you can test it, right? And so that gives you a lot of liberty that we don't have. If you have access in residential, if you have access to even that site glass, you can look and see, do we, you know, do we have high moisture content? That gives you another tool in the toolbox that we don't have often in residential. But in residential, so so you're very limited in what you've got. Um, uh, it, well, that, there's a question right there. Should we be installing sight glasses in residential? I would argue yes. You would say yes? I'd be easy for me to say yes. I, I can see it. But one of the main reasons why it's really beneficial in refrigeration is because subcooling uh, can be tricky when you have receivers. And so you have that additional benefit. And residential, mo it, Yes, moisture liquid indicator. It's both, right? And in residential, we don't really need that because we're stacking liquid in the condenser. So subcooling is a lot more effective and it's another it's another expense and another leak point. But uh, sure, it can't hurt as long as you're doing it right. You know, it definitely can't hurt. Um, I, I'm most of the systems where I had some, you know, uh, shall I say influence over it, we would install a combination of parts like you see over here. Now it's, it's added expense. Yeah. Like you see in that diagram. So it's an expansion device. Uh, a moisture liquid indicator and then a, a filter dryer. Uh, again, you're not going to see that on, as a rule on a residential unit. Um, what, what I was getting at is when you do have a case where a compressor has failed due to electrical failure, um, then your odds of it being a burnout are much higher. So you go in that oh, you know, yes. you're reading shorted to ground, your odds are very high. Yes. Uh, and that's where we will often use, they, they're not great, but they can work in a pinch. The ones that you just do that little de minimis, you know, over the, over the port, and it'll give you a indication whether you have a really bad burnout or not. It's not an oh, absolute it. pass oh, fail, yeah. but no, it's something. Um, and you can also often go just by the smell. Uh, now, often you're not going to know that until you are there to replace the compressor, though. And that's right. that's a tricky thing, um, which is where I'm a fan. If you can and you know you're going to be replacing the compressor when you troubleshoot it. And again, this is this doesn't always work, but especially if it's warranty, that sort of thing. If you can go ahead and weigh out the charge at that time. Now you can also know if you were way overcharged or undercharged. And at that point, you could actually potentially pull that compressor out and actually look at the oil and see what you've got on your hands at that point. Again, very rarely is that realistic in residential, but it is at least an option. Uh, I want to pause here because Adam and Matt, I know you guys have both done a lot of compressors. You've been ran into a lot of burnouts. What are some of your um, things you want to add here? Um, I was going to say so, an idea I've had for a long time. I've never had the opportunity to do it, but I was kind of wondering if, you know, Kalos has done it, Brian. But um, if you have a really bad system that you, let's say you have a burn, you know, a compressor that you know, had a burnout on, um, you have contaminants in the system. Have you guys ever installed a filter dryer with basically ball valves and a bypass with a T so you could just isolate the system? You're not cutting in, you're not adding any more contaminants, and you could pull a vacuum uh, when you replace the filter dryer on just that small, short, one-foot piece of line? I never have, but it's not a bad idea. Um, a lot of guys have have brought that up. I think Joe Shearer has done it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not a bad idea. It's, it's always the challenge is, is having that distinction. Right. 
like if you know that it's really bad, then that makes a lot of sense. But very rarely do you know until it's already kind of too late. Now it's not priced in, you know, like it's yeah. a tricky, it's a tricky business, especially with residential clients. You can't go back and say, oh, hey, Mrs. Jones, I know I t- what I told you the price is going to be. Now it's going to be five hundred dollars more. You know, it's like it just that conversation it doesn't, doesn't work. Well. Yeah. So it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky business there, but it's, it's not a bad idea. And I do like that. I like that, um, that concept. Um, what about it? What about accumulators? Um, mm. one of the things that we have the practice of nowadays when, cause we work on a lot of heat pumps that have accumulators is when we know that we've got pretty bad, uh, or, or really anytime we, it's a, it's a burnout, um, electrical failed compressor. We go ahead and, and we try to remember to just get a new accumulator and just replace it with it because oh, wow. it can hold so much crappy oil in it. And sure. often we can't put the suction line dryer. It's not practical to put it in between the accumulator and the compressor because they're so close coupled and like repiping right. it would be a would be a major right. problem. Right. Um, it's a way that we do that. I mean, you can empty them, obviously, um, but sometimes even emptying them, you don't really feel like you necessarily get you're not going to get it all out. Right. It's just like you said with the uh, recovery tank. It's the same kind of problem. Yeah. Yeah. So they can hold a lot of crap. Depends on the age, obviously, and the severity of the burnout. But I, but I like that approach because accumulators are so inexpensive in residential. I mean, they're just it's just a little tank. I mean, there's nothing to it. Um, and we found that that actually um, it also reduces another leak point because often on a lot of those same systems, bottoms of accumulators tend to tend to rust you, out over time. Yes. Another thing. But you put a new one in a new one. Yeah. Yeah, not cutting, not cutting it out, leaving it out. Obviously, if it's designed for an accumulator, you need to put it back in. Um, clearly, but that's that's just another one. So, um, so Jim, uh, sorry, go ahead. But I was just going to say, Jim, a little while ago, you mentioned uh, suction line filters versus oh, a filter dryer. Such a thing as it's just literally a filter, so there's no desiccant in it. So it's just a literally just a filter. Uh, you know, the the catch all is has desiccant and filtration capabilities combined. Uh, but there are just simply filters. So we use them for both oil. Like in, you see here in this in this image here, there's the uh, porous molded core, which has the desiccant material. And there's a binder that holds all that together. And then there's a fiberglass pad uh, and, you know, some uh, filtering material there. Uh, but we do make products that are simply filters. So there's no desiccant, uh, limited pressure drop across it. Some people choose to install suction filters. We got a fair amount of literature on that. That's something of interest to you. That's an option for you. Uh, some folks will install those during a new installation. I don't know how many people, I don't know how common practice that is anymore. So that's ma- made to be left in the system. Then I that's would... made to be left in the system. Okay. Uh, limited. Pre- I'm not going to say there's no pressure drop, but this it's less pressure drop than a fouled, uh, Morris molded, uh, molded porous core would have over time. So to be clear, because some of people might just have heard that, <laughs> that is specifically a filter only, and we see this a filter lot. In, only. We see this a lot in racks when you have. Um, um, when you have actual removable cores, um, replaceable cores, you know, sometimes you literally just leave essentially a strainer in there. Um, basically, but, yeah, it's just a very simple filter to, to catch but no desiccant. So there's right. no moisture removal or acid removal removal. Mm-hmm. All it's going to do is get the hammer handles in the lunch boxes. Yeah. And just to talk about, um, so, so we, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but I want to ha- hit it again. So suction dryers are one of the best uh, approaches when you do know you have a burnout. When you know you have a contaminant system, using suction dryers is one of the best approaches. So just talk through that uh, quickly, why we do that, and then you know maybe how long you want to leave it in. What are some of the things that you want to do around suction dryers? Well, I mean, think about it. The, what's the most expensive component in that system? And you've just put a new one in. It's the compressor. So following a burnout, and maybe that's a wrong choice of words, but I guess it's as good as any. Uh, you've had mechanical failures, you've had electrical failures, all combined in this device. And while it's dying, it's doing its best to exhaust all that stuff everywhere in the system. Now, you can do your best to, I mean, in the old days, Folks would take R11 and flush the system out and just blow that off into the atmosphere. You can't do that anymore. All right. And then after you did that, you'd flush it out with R22 for a while. 
you know, because R22 is cheap. And then you just vent that off in the atmosphere. But you don't, don't do that anymore. <laughs> and then after you're done doing all that, uh, then you'd start pulling a vacuum. I mean, you've just gotten rid of a whole lot of stuff if you flush it with R R11 was a good solvent, and then you and then you hammer it again with some R22. But those are things that are no longer acceptable and have not been for a very long time. So we've always contended the best place to capture moisture is in the liquid line where you have elevated temperatures. That seems to help with that process of a adsorption in the molded porous core. Now, when you add a suction line device, you're giving yourself the insurance policy of capturing stuff that may have passed through the system already. I mean, we're relying on this, uh, filter dryer to continue to collect stuff that circulates through the system on a continual basis. Some things might make it through the filter dryer on a first pass that it captures on a subsequent ride through the system. And if you have an additional filter dryer in the suction line, you help keep that stuff from entering the compressor and potentially doing damage to it. Now, our contention with that, a good practice, is to check the pressure drop across that suction line device after it's run for, I mean, it, in, a, in a perfect world, maybe after 24 hours, certainly after 48. It's good practice to go back and see how the system's doing if you had a serious failure. And if it's exhibiting a fair amount of pressure drop, uh, again, we got charts depending on application and refrigerant. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of pressure drop in the suction line for it to be detrimental to the performance of the system. Once you hit that point, then we contend it's time to replace it. Uh, good practice if, depending on the severity of the burnout, and maybe to put another suction line filter dryer in and then do that over. Go back and check it in 24, 48 hours. And depending on how severe this burnout and the much debris, you might have to do it a third time, but generally speaking, maybe not. Uh, at that third point, maybe you simply take it out and put in a section of copper tubing to replace the filter dryer that you had in the suction line. But when you do that, then you also put another liquid line filter dryer. Once again, more and more liquid dryers. Now, I want to. I want to add here. Well, I got to pay my house payment. <laughs> it's true. It's it's expensive nowadays. It's crazy. Corey mentioned that he flushes his copper with Diet Coke, and he's never had a problem. Um, but I, I think that's just him. Yeah, uh, I think he's talking about cleaning his windshield. But he, it's maybe. better than his regular Coke. It could be. Good point. Good point. Um, a couple things I want to add here. Um, so again. Big difference if you have replaceable core dryers versus the one like we show here. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a whole different animal, right? It's a lot easier in that yes. world. But when we're dealing with stuff where you've got to you've got to work Field in miles. this world, you almost always are going to have with suction dryers. You're almost always going to have a port so you can measure that pressure drop across that suction dryer. That's a yeah. practice I would like to see people do more and more of. Actually, yes. when you show up on one where there's a suction dryer present, because this happens a lot, you show up on a you don't know how long it's been in there. You didn't put the compressor no. in. you show up. It's got a suction dryer on it. Just check that pressure drop. If you're start, if you're over three, then you should probably start looking at charts. If you're over eight, then it needs to oh come gosh. out for sure, right? Like, oh gosh, no really over five. Um, but one, but one of the things that I really want to hit on here is the reason why, because and this is one of my favorite topics. So, uh, so give me a second here, and that is that anytime you drop your suction pressure when you don't need to, that has a massive effect on your compression ratio, which means that you also have a massive effect on compressor cooling. Your compressor is going to run hotter, system efficiency, and system capacity. So you did a triple whammy of nonsense on that system when you have yes. pressure drop on your suction, which isn't nearly as big of a deal on the liquid side for a lot of it reasons was, that we right. want to get into here. But it's not as it still matters, but it doesn't matter nearly as much on the liquid the side as it relates to that yes. uh, than it does on the suction side. So absolutely. Suction dryers are awesome at this. Uh, this is the message that I just want to get across. Suction dryers are awesome. They do a great job when you're having to clean up a system. But leaving them in when they're restricted is no bueno because it has it's massive effects idea. on the system. Yeah, so I, if, I, if, I if, second you, that. if you are messing around with the compression ratio and that, if you're cleaning up a system due to a burnout or whatever else, uh, you could actually be putting that system in danger of repeating it, the, the, the failure once again. 
oh, yeah. simply by it. leaving it in. And it's not so a lot of people think, oh, well, it's contaminated. So now it's putting the, that crap back in the system. No, it could be doing its job and it could cause the compressor to fail again. Right. Because now it's causing so much pressure drop. That now your compressor overheats, the pressure and that drop becomes issue. the that becomes the cause of failure the next time. So you have to yeah. pay attention to that. Yeah, and some folks think that you can get these filter dryers hot enough that they release the moisture that they captured, and that's going to be tough to do that. I mean, the activation process when you hear that it's activated alumina or activated molecular sieve, activation is the process that the manufacturer uses to drive off residual moisture before we pack it all up. So it's got to get pretty darn hot. To release moisture uh and you're going to be hard pressed to release moisture or the contamination back into the system necessarily i'm not going to say it's impossible but yep. that's it's a pressure drop like you say brian that's the kit that's the problem i want to bring this up michael said uh, it's also highly important that dryers are sized properly for the system um so when you think about sizing dryers um i imagine just looking at your charts right well, you got that. And plus, I'll put a plug in for this. We have two things that you can use if you want to go down this path with us. We have something called Virtual Engineer. It's a software selection program. Uh, it's on our website. It's free to use. Uh, we also have uh, human tech support where we have engineers and people that have been with our company a considerable period of time that will answer the phone and help you resolve problems should you need help or assistance in any way. And oftentimes we answer questions about products and systems that we didn't make, but we're able to help. So you're saying I'm supposed to call people on my texting device? Like actually, like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah, on your texting device, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. my texting your, and Facebook device. On your porn yeah. surfer, yes, absolutely. <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, I had to go there. <laughs> I didn't say anything. No, 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 no. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was going to say you brought up uh, earlier, um, I guess, oversizing a filter dryer, liquid line filter dryer. How does that work? What What's the well, benefit? You're that? just you're just adding volume. Now, okay, so you're adding volume of desiccant and filtration a surface area. So if you've got a lot of particulates and a lot of contamination you're trying to trap, the more product you put at it, the more chances you have of collecting it. Uh, the flip side of that is if you go crazy, you can offset the amount of charge that you might need, the refrigerant charge for the system. You can alter that. So if you're trying to weigh in a charge that was precisely determined ahead of time, if you oversize the filter dryer you know too much you're going to have to alter that amount of refrigerant that you put back in the system but oversizing it just adds to the capability of the of that filtration system that contaminant control system to do its job if you are loading it up because of contaminants from a burnout or what may what catastrophic thing may have happened Does that makes sense did i answer your question yeah, yeah for sure one of the things that you mentioned that I wanted to address again was because um, you said, you know, overheating a um, a filter dryer, causing it to release its moisture probably isn't. Oh, happen. yeah. I, I, yes. Go, I'm sorry. I'll let no, you no. Go. I just wanted to add, though, that like uh, I, I don't want people unsweating stuff <laughs> just be for other reasons. I really want techs to get out of the unsweating business, yeah. uh, especially as A2L start to come around and, and you have refrigerants that are getting trained. And your oils preferred and method is a is a is. Is a sawzall, right? <laughs> sawzall, no, right? No, right? No, right? No, you're a chainsaw. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. no, no. Uh, and 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 I I feel compelled to just to reiterate this. I am not suggesting you can get things hot enough in the system to drive the moisture off of a filter dryer. I think that's very unlikely to happen. Also, we'd like to see people remove components, especially anything they want to send back to us for analysis, with the appropriate tubing cutter. Yes. Not a sawzall. <laughs> not a hacksaw. Indeed. All right. Indeed. And 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 generally speaking, not a torch, because if they put a torch on it, that means they're usually in a hurry. It's at the end of the job and they're going to barbecue everything and make more problems. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yeah, and then yeah, more issues, and then you won't even be able to tell what's what. You know, like when, once and, you get it and, back, it's going to be yeah. So and they send something back to us yeah. that it's it's torched. We can't yeah. do. I mean, it, yeah, it looks like it's burned up with a torch. Yep, that's yeah. the problem. Yeah. Uh, one final thing that I wanted to mention, just at, while we're on the topic of suction dryers, is as much as possible, we do want to get them close to the compressor. Now, in a lot of cases, what we find that we do, especially because we're in heat pump country, and and getting that suction dryer close to the compressor by the time you have an accumulator and a reversing valve and everything else can be a nightmare. And so a lot of cases we do put it outside the condenser, but again, remember we're already replacing accumulators or emptying it. Um, we're, we're paying attention to a lot of this other stuff, but if you do put a suction dryer on the outside of a condensing unit and it's a heat pump, you need to make sure the sucker's locked into cool mode. Um, don't let it run in heat mode. And this goes back to another comment that somebody made about, um, let me see if I can find it here real quick. I think I might have forgotten to put it up here. But the whole issue of, of people replacing mufflers with uh, oh. suction dryers. Uh, we've seen that happen a few times because they look very similar. Uh, yeah. Suction dryers do not belong in the discharge line. They only they need to be no discharge line, no vapor line, unless it's actually locked in, in cooling mode. Um, otherwise, you're going to have issues. We have had some customers in the past install um, contaminant controls in the discharge line especially in heat pump scenarios. We've never recommended that, but there's some OEMs that have done that um, for various reasons. Uh, all right, Jimmy wanted us to to talk about the, the bypass ball valves thing again. Um, so Adam was the one who brought it up, so I'll let Adam cover it. <laughs> I, I don't think necessarily you need a bypass. Like but what I was suggesting is you could add two T's and actually make like a bypass around um, so that way you can continue operating the system um, when you change a, a filter dryer. But realistically, you could just add two ball valves. JB makes ball valves, whatever. I'm sure other Sporland probably makes them. Everyone makes them, right? Uh, you just have one. Oh, each side. Yeah, you put one on each side of the filter dryer, then you could close them off and you don't contaminate the whole system. You don't deal with uh, pulling the, the charge or pumping anything down. Then you have one foot of lines that you're evacuating. Yeah, that's one approach. The other approach would be if you're just trying to bypass something later, um, you could also just uh, just put one valve in and just do a bypass. That would be more like a suction approach. And again, this is assuming we have infinite space and we can do whatever we want. And the reality is that doesn't always work out and isn't always practical, depending on the situation and the application. Um, well, good stuff. We are we are finding ourselves at time, which is why I. Uh, which Sorry. is why I uh, put this screen up for people to find uh, Jim and uh, all the different yeah. amazing Sporland stuff. Anything else that you want to leave us with, Jim? Uh, this hour is well, that's our, quick. That's our phone number that you can punch into your texting device to actually reach our technical support. Is um, this your phone number? No, it's not. You can't have it. Uh, <laughs> if, you could, also, if you could give that to us, that would be great. <laughs> no, not at all. We'll put and it on then, screen. Of course, that's our tech support email. And we have people during normal business hours that respond to phone calls. We do call people back and we do respond to emails. And these are folks that generally have been with our company for a long time and who have found themselves in that role. Uh, oftentimes uh, in the past, you would have reached me if you called that number, but hopefully for your benefit, you won't uh, get me. Uh, and Sporland.com, there's all kinds of resources there. And then we have we're starting to accumulate a video library of YouTube shorts out on, uh, on at sporland.com uh, under on our YouTube page. Um, so take a look at that sometime if you get a chance. Good stuff. Well, it's been fun uh, getting to know you uh, hanging out at the symposium. I think we need to at least see the hat at least one time before you, before you go here. You think? But, yeah, yeah, no, I, I think we, yeah, we definitely need to, we need yeah. to see the hat here. We need to, we need to bring um, you in solo. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yes. it's, it's, I, i'm very i'm very pro uh the free marketing so uh and he's yeah <laughs> kalos <laughs> yeah i think yeah. i'm the That's, only one that had one at the yeah. symposium yeah yeah that is our refrigeration team it's very special very few people have that so yeah good stuff all right well hey jim uh adam matt thank you guys so much and uh thanks oh, for gosh. taking time away yeah, from you, uh from your life to do this you bet uh i appreciate what you all are doing Thanks, man. Have a good have a good evening. Take care. You bet.